Hold on on tight tight for the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the the alternative alternative to the alternative alternative media. It's a place, a, place, a special, special place, place where, where even truth seekers fear to tread. Fine, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Affirmative. Okay, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of The Greatest Show on Earth. I'm Greg Anthony here, the investigative journal on First Amendment Radio. Okay, today, let's do part two of what I started yesterday, and that was asking the question, why in the hell aren't the Vatican and the Jesuits ever held accountable for mass murder and genocides? Then I received an email a couple days ago, and uh, I had mentioned that I had, over the last 15 years, talked about at least 15 to 10 to 15 genocides that the Vatican was involved in, and somebody said, well, give me one. So yesterday, I started talking about the Serbian genocide, and then I'm about halfway through what I want to do on that, so we're going to talk about that. But there's remarkable similarities between what went on there in 1941 to 1944 that went on in Germany. And so what I mentioned yesterday was that the uh, mentor of Hitler was none other than Pope Pius Twelfth, right? So I wanted to refer you to a book. And what I find interesting is that you never hear about any of these books. And these were written, this one particular book I'm going to talk about was written back around, what, 1939? No, when was it? Uh, Yeah, in in that area, okay? Uh, I'm not sure exactly of the date, but what I'm trying to get at is a lot of these books that talked about the truth behind what the papacy was really doing in Europe and then in the New World has not ever seen the light of day anymore. Nobody talks about it, and you don't see that many new books coming out because there is basically a uh, suppression of this type of talk anymore. And if you think that the mainstream media doesn't talk about uh, the conservatives in America. They're all the right wing was always complaining about that. That's that's orchestrated. But this story and the real story about the Vatican-led Jesuit New World Order and all of their tentacles all over the world to this day is the biggest suppression known in the history of man. And for a newspaper in this country to neglect it, or for a radio station, or for a TV station, you can just see that the, I always said that, uh, they're in control of it. And they want to deflect any kind of criticism on a mass basis. So you get this garbage, you you know, you turn on the TV, Jimmy Kimmel's talking to uh, Joe Biden, you know, who's running for president. And uh, you've heard about all the scandals he's involved with. Then they talk to Hillary Clinton. And all these people uh, are nothing but shills for them and have committed every crime known to man. But people, really, if you are a Democrat, you don't want to hear anything bad about your people. And if you're a Republican, it's the same thing. And they got you brainwashed. Listening to the left or the right the Hegelian dialectic, and one screams about the other, and it goes on and on and on, but the real stories are hidden, and that's what we talk about here. Now this book, uh, I want to talk about, it's John Cornwell's book, Hitler's Pope, and it's a devastating uh, refutation of the claim that this Pope, Pope Pius XII, diplomacy can in any way be characterized as wisdom. Instead of a portrait of a man worthy of sainthood, uh, in his book, he lays out the story of a narcissistic, power-hungry manipulator who was prepared to lie, to appease, and to collaborate in order to accomplish his ecclesiastical purpose, which was not to save lives or even to protect the Catholic Church, but more narrowly to protect and advance the power of the papacy. And that's what they're doing today. The material... Uh, the Roman Catholic journalist Cornwell gathered 
Taking more extensive view of Eugenio Pacelli, Pope Pius XII, he was born 1876, died 1958. He was Pope from 1939 to 1958, and he was Hitler's mentor. And uh, life amounted not to uh, an exoneration of the negative charges against Pope Pius XII for his action as, and a lack of actions during World War II, but a wider indictment spanning Pacelli's career from the beginning of the century. And his research told the story of a bid for unprecedented papal power that by 1933 had drawn the Roman Catholic Church into complicity with the darkest forces of the era. Guess who that was? I found, you know, this man found evidence, moreover, that from the early stage in his career, Pacelli betrayed an undeniably... Uh, had undeniable hatred toward the Jews, and that his diplomacy in Germany in the 1930s had resulted in betrayal. Catholic political associations that might have challenged German Fuhrer Hitler uh, and thwarted the final solution. But he was behind Hitler. He fomented, he basically plucked him out and picked him as his point man. Among the many initiatives in his long diplomatic career, Pacelli was responsible for the treaty with Serbia, which contributed to the tensions that led to the First World War. So he has tentacles all over the place. Remember I said there's a similarity to what we're going to talk about, the Serbian genocide, the genocide here of uh, God. Wow, Serbs. Jews and gypsies just happened to become state property like cattle. And 240,000 people were forced into Catholicism. If not, they were killed. <laughs> and people still do not want to get the real story and listen to this garbage that goes on every day on CNN, on Fox, you name it. And it's just a crying shame because it's never going to change. And you're being ushered in to another Vatican genocide, which is going on all over the world to this day. That's why that we America's been in wars all but 20 years of our history. Now, he took a more extensive look, and he found this hatred towards the Jews, and that his diplomacy in Germany in the 30s was basically to back Hitler. Among the many initiatives in his long diplomatic career, uh, he, was re he was responsible for that treaty with Serbia I talked about. Twenty years later, he struck an accord with Hitler, which helped sweep the fear into legal dictatorship while neutralizing the potential of Germany. Now, we've given you quotes about Hitler and how he basically said he's patterned his Third Reich on the uh, organization of the Catholic Church and the Jesuits. But there's an interesting story that's never told. And uh, there was a housekeeper for Pacelli who gave a, I believe it was in one book, I can't remember, I think it was uh, a book by Thompson. I can't remember, uh, I think his first name's Robert. But anyway, he documented that she said that Hitler used to come over to Pacelli all the time to his house and get his marching orders before he became the Fuhrer. Okay? So we got Hitler backing uh, the Nazis. Well, I mean, we have Pacelli backing the Nazis. And then, what, is he a saint? Yeah. <laughs> when thousands of German anti-Nazis were tortured to death in Hitler's concentration camps, when the Polish intelligentsia were slaughtered, when hundreds of thousands of Russians died as a result of being treated as, uh, you know, subhuman, and when six million human beings were murdered for being non-Aryan, the Catholic Church officials in Germany bolstered the regime perpetrating these crimes. The Pope in Rome, the spiritual head and the supreme moral teacher of the Roman Catholic Church, he remained silent. In the face of these greatest of moral depravities, which mankind has been forced to witness in recent centuries, the moral teachings of the Church, dedicated to love and charity, could be heard in no other form but vague generalities. So, we hear still to this day, we have remembrances of the Holocaust, we talk about America being the, the staunch ally of, of uh, Israel. But where is this story? And why do we still 
adorn and admire this the Pope in office today, which is nothing more than extension of Pacelli. Because, folks, you've been lied to, and our leaders are in bed with these people, literally, literally in bed. And should we go into the great Saint Pope uh, John Paul II? And what did John Paul II do? He was a person that he would, when he was Pope, uh, he he was Pope over the greatest sexual scandals in the history of the church and ushered that in. These people are sick. And we still to this day send our kids to Catholic schools. And the reason they do is nobody tells you. Now, people will say, well, you know, these priests and these nuns, they're, they're good people. Well, that's true. You know, many of these lower level priests and nuns, I found out over the years, they have no idea of this. They either don't want to hear about it, and they've got such a cushy life that, you know, they've, they're so used to having everything taken care of for them, they don't want to rock the boat. But let me tell you, I've talked to a number of these priests who got out of the Catholic Church, and that's a huge story, an unbelievable story, and those are the brave ones. But here's the idea. If the tree is evil from the roots, is it okay to sit on the branches of the tree? Ask yourself that. Now, I have a Catholic background. I was brought up uh, and went to Catholic grade school, high school, Catholic kindergarten, and I never had a problem in the world with these priests or nuns. In fact, I remember running home once when I was young, telling my mother I wanted to be a priest. Yeah, well, that lasted about six months, not even that, <laughs> until baseball season started. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, once you learn about this stuff, and I had no idea then, sure, you're a young kid being told everything and believing everything, and saying, man, I really want to be a good person, and I want to get close to Jesus, and the only way to do that is to confess your sins to the priest, right? And I remember going in there, and to this day, you never forget these words. I Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was, and I have to sit there and go, okay, when was it? And then uh, I had my routine of sins. And uh, then their routine was, okay, ten our fathers, ten Hail Marys. And you go out of there and uh, sit at the, you know, kneel down and say them. And I, I tell you, I, I started to do this. I remember I used to say every one of them. Now, you say the Hail Mary 20 times, you start going mad, you know. So I remember I'd go, okay, I'll say it once and times it by 10. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember telling one of the priests that who were having a laugh, and he said, well, you can't do that. And he was looking at me kind of funny and laughing. And I said, well, I'm just utilizing my math skills. So I would say one Hail Mary times it by 10. One, our father, times it by 10, and I'd be the hell out of there in a minute playing baseball. So anyway, on the more serious side, uh, get this book uh, by John Cornwell, Hitler's Pope. You'll never be the same. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on, and the, this factual stuff. And once you start reading this, you'll start understanding why you've been lied to, how the media today continues those lies by not... by revering these people, calling them holy men. And, you know, I always find it funny. You know, you, as a Catholic, you grew up knowing all of the Catholic ceremonies, right? And one of my favorite was always Ash Wednesday, okay? You go in there in the morning, and they put these black ashes with a cross on the top of your, on your forehead, you know, and they tell you, you can't ever take it off till the next day. You gotta, You can't wash your face at night and take that black stuff off. All right. So, you know, who knows? I can't remember. I remember I used to uh, not do it, wake up in the morning, and it was kind of fun. I would tell my mom, I don't have to wash my face. The priest told me, you know, get away with having to do that. But she'd say, yes, but you got to brush your teeth. I'd say, okay. But anyway, uh, just this last Ash, you know, the last uh, Ash Wednesday. You turn on the TV and there's these news broadcasters from Fox and CNN, mostly from Fox. Uh, they all got their ashes on their head, you know. And I'm going, haven't they learned anything? No. Or they have and they're hiding it. 
or they're really working for these people, you know? If you can't beat them, join them, become an evil news broadcaster and tell people lies, never get to the truth. That's exactly what it is. And let me tell you something. Growing up wanting to be, at one point, as I was finishing school, college, wanting to be a journalist, I really thought it was a very, very honorable profession. Now, you're going to find good people in it, no doubt. But man, at the levels of the top, it is just as bad as the Vatican and the governments. But what are you going to do? You live in this fantasy world they created. And I swear, if people really took these things seriously, after reading John Cornwell's book, you're going to come away saying, you know, yeah, what Greg says and what other people have said when I hear that Hitler's mentor was Pope Pius XII, it's going to sink in a little more. Because what? It's not based on me hating the Catholic Church. Once Somebody once said, I remember when I started doing this show, people said, you know, I mentioned I was a Catholic, and then he said, oh, he must have been sexually abused, and he hates the Catholic Church, and he wants to get back at them and is spreading all these lies. Oh, I heard that. And I said very, very simply, that's not true. I never had one single problem with a priest or a nun. Never. I never even heard about that stuff when I went to grade school and high school. And even in college. I mean, I went to a, you know, a state university, but I didn't hear about this stuff really. Living in America as a journalist for a number of years, I didn't even know about it. And I, my job was to find out things. That's how hard it is. And one, and I remember one time I was working in St. Louis, I think it was, and a story came up about the Vatican and all this. And I remember my belief system was so ingrained. I said, oh, these people are crazy. They're conspiracy theorists. I said that. Yeah. Because I grew up in this country. I grew up in the Catholic Church. And when you hear something like that, you don't believe it. And you're threatened. You say, I can't be involved in an organization. That's terrible. These people hate Catholics. They hate everybody that's involved in Catholicism. And, you know, that's what I said. And I was a journalist. And, you know, that, look, when you're a journalist, you're supposed to, like, find out everything and know a lot. But you don't find this out anywhere because they keep it from you. It's hidden. It's hidden from many priests and nuns. They don't know. And I ask myself, how is that possible? And, you know, it's possible because if you read about the Jesuit vows and how these people work their way up the ladder, you'll understand. Because many lower-level Jesuits never hear about this either. They are just good soldiers. Just like the Nazi soldiers. You ever watch the American movies? When you grow up and you watch World War II movies, the Nazis are always depicted as the bad guys who hate God, and the Americans are the good guys who love God. But, you know, there's a few movies made from the other side of the coin, and you start seeing that, generally, ideology gives motives and resolutions for killing in war and murdering. It gives you the justifi justification to do it. The ideologies and what you're told when you're growing up in your religion or in your country, that's what gives you the justification to kill somebody else. Now, nothing more came to light when many of these Vietnam veterans came back and learned the truth. And if you really want to know the story of one, one of my good friends who passed away, I think it might be six years ago, his name was Dangerous Dan, Lieutenant Colonel Dangerous Dan Marvin. He was a Green Beret in Vietnam, and he learned the truth. He became a Christian and basically told the truth about what I was just talking about, how ideology can justify killing, but when he realized what it was about, he told the truth. And you realize that, you know, in the name of patriotism, 
You can't blame these people for being misled, but it is his hope that people would find the truth. And that's my hope, really, on this show, is that you you take a, a little story like, a little show like this, and you may hear it on the Internet, just flicking around. You know, people look at they see something on the Internet, they turn it on, and depending on your belief system, you might say, oh, genocide of the Vatican, oh, I can't read that. I can't look at that. But if you do and you catch this show and then you hear, oh, go to John Cornwell's book, uh, well, you know, Hitler's Pope, then you start reading about it and seeing factual information uh, that basically says, hey, these people aren't really that crazy. But it's a, it's a leap. you got to get over your belief systems and you got to start searching farther and farther for what... Sh- you know, what are we here for anyway? I mean, most people, and I talk to a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life, a lot of different faiths, anywhere from atheists to Hindus to whatever, and uh, Christians, non-Christians, uh, you name it, Sikhs. Uh, I can't think of one major religion I haven't spoken and discussed this. I used to sit with the Seventh-day Adventists every Sunday for a while, just to get their take on the Vatican, because they were one of the few organizations that really tell you what the Vatican is like, and they're not afraid to do it. Now, there's a lot of infiltration in the Seventh-day Adventists, and even to the point that the founder might have been (laughs) on the other side. But the people who start reading about these Vatican atrocities were quite interesting because they gave me also a biblical outlook on this that I never got. Because there's two ways to get at this story. I got at it from a a worldwide political avenue. But there's also a spiritual avenue here. And so I was so, for years, talking politically, talking about all these wrongdoings, talking about beheadings, all the things that they did. And I overlooked the spiritual. And once I sat with them and others who talked about the spiritual ideas in the Bible and other things and how the Vatican really was suppressing this and killing people, you saw the the bringing together. And that's when I started saying on my radio show, you can't, what I find are people that concentrate like me on the political side of these evils. And then I see people, all they do is they talk about the Bible, and the evil Vatican. And I said, you know what? We are both turning off people who really might want to get this. So I said, bring it together. Talk both about the political and the spiritual. Don't basically shove it down somebody's throat. Because really the idea is to get somebody who has no idea of this, just like me, I had no idea. I even thought people were conspiracy theorists who said the Vatican was evil. Take people like me and turn them around. But let them do it themselves. Because you can't do it. You can give them some information, but let them make the decisions. Make them read. Let them go out and do some of the things that I did to understand this. And you know what? In the end, you're going to be a better person for it. Even though Sometimes you can't even talk about it with the people closest to you. Because it isn't something you're trying to shove down anybody's throat, no matter if it's your mother, no matter if it's your brother, no matter if it's the guy on the street, or if it's the plumber, or the guy who comes over. You can't shove it down their throat. But you can give them some piece of information that they may understand it. And I'll tell you, They'll be better off for it. Back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple Android device and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today. 
so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border Org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The following program is labeled with dangerous and off limits by the supreme Jesuit command. But stand tall, people. Listen up, and you may just learn something. Okay, uh, boys and girls, we're back for the second half hour of the investigative journal. Don't forget to go to my website at gregantonysjournal.wordpress.com, and there are shows there talking about the Vatican-led New World Order and the Jesuits, of course, since, oh God, going on 15 years, and you're going to get a lot of stuff there. So go there, and also if you uh, see the uh, PayPal, we're always uh, taking donations because you know this is not viable. People, advertisers will not advertise, big advertisers and advertisers that actually have American dollars will not pay for shows like this because we're considered conspiracy theorists, people who really don't know what we're talking about, and they cannot be associated with Catholic hatred. That's what you'll hear, and nothing is farther than the truth. Okay, so I want to talk about the genocide in Serbia. We've been talking about that yesterday. It's the second half of this. Uh, I've gotten about halfway through of what I wanted to talk about, about the Vatican Jesuit involvement in this. But the last thing I want to mention is don't forget to go to John Cornwell's brilliant book, Hitler's Pope, uh, written still when people could read these stories. And in fact, a journalist back then, Saul Friedlander, uh, wrote this. He said, uh, let's see what he said. He said, uh, get his book, John Cornwell's brilliant book, uh, brought the author authoritarianism and centralization of his predecessors to their most extreme stage, and we know what that was, the annihilation of six million Jews with Pope Pius XII's uh, boy, Hitler. Nowadays, he says, we may not know what a saint should be, but we do know what a saint should not be. And he said, a man like this, Pius XII, a man of narrow spirit and heart, a man who could not find at the very least a candid word when millions of human beings from all corners of Europe were being slaughtered. Some of them from under his own windows were led to their systematic extermination. And that last little quote I did a fact to show on that last little quote going back maybe five years. And it was interesting because 
there was a band of Jews in Italy, in Rome, that were rounded up and killed right before the eyes of the Vatican, right under the window of Pope Pius XII, and he did nothing. So you'd say, well, why? And you'd say, well, he was the one that mentored Hitler. He pushed Nazism for a reason, and that was his extreme motives of power, to bring power back to the papacy. It's no, it's no uh, coincidence that all these Orthodox Christians were killed in Russia by Stalin. Now, do you know who Stalin really was mentored by? Stalin, if you really look at his history, was born to a rich Catholic family. That's not his name. His name is about one foot long. He was named Stalin. It's translated to the Man of Steel. And he was educated, very bright, bright kid when he was young, plucked out by the Catholics. He was educated at a place called Tiflis, which was in Russia. It was a Jesuit school, and he became a Jesuit priest. No one really knows about this stuff. And he was picked to head up, you know what. And there's an interesting connection between him and the, uh, the <laughs> boy, this story is it's just coming back to me and I, I tell you when you start connecting the dots between Jesuit Georgetown University and the Jesuit priest who started the school of our foreign service which still to this day you know pushes out all of our diplomats okay our foreign diplomats and this guy was a Jesuit priest who was sent to Russia under the guise of Catholic human aid to the Bolsheviks. But his main concern was he had a satchel of money from the State Department. He's a spy. And his goal was to convince, was to convince uh, the Bolshevik leaders at the time, Lenin and others, that Stalin needed a place at the top, needed to be one of the powerful people in the Bolshevik movement. Stalin was a bit wary of it, but when he was presented with all this money from the West, so basically here we are funding the Bolsheviks. Stalin was given his push into power by none other than this Jesuit priest. And I'm not going to make it easy for you. Why don't you look up who it is? He was the head of our school of foreign, he started the school of foreign service. He's on President Eisenhower's website still. And when I called Georgetown about him, I said, how could a low, how could a teacher become, get a, get a web page on one of our presidents? I said, did he have involvement in, did he ever go to Mexico and incite a revolution there? Oh, not him. Did he ever go to Iraq? and do his dirty work there? No. Did he ever go and deal with Stalin in Russia? No. We don't know anything about that. He was just a, he was just a teacher. I said, but how did he get on Eisenhower's website? Well, you look up his name. I could give it to you, but I don't want to make it easy for you. Somebody's going, did Greg forget that name? I did not. Okay. So, get Cornwell's book. Uh, Hitler's Pope. Okay, there you go. Now, I want to get into the last uh, part of this show. I want to try to finish. I might not. Got a little carried away. But anyway, we're talking about gen the genocide in, from 1941 to 1944, the Vatican-led genocide. And I'm going to show you why. This is documented by some really good authors and writers who were there at the time. But anyway... Let's get back to this idea, the, I, uh, the ideology of a man gives him the resolution to be a murderer. And the ideology of the Ustasi and their head was nothing more than clerical fascism. And the Roman Catholic Church, okay, together with its representatives, was involved in all of this. And what happened was, there was a gospel uh, on June 24th, 22nd, 1941, 
Mile, uh, this guy, they adopted the religious conversion law there and obliged the Orthodox to convert to Catholicism. And this is what was put out. We shall slaughter one-third of the Serbs, deport one-third, and force the last third into Roman Catholicism and thus make them Croats, Croatians. Okay? We shall destroy every trace of theirs, and all that will be left will be a bad memory. For Serbs, Jews, and Gypsies, we have three million bullets. That's what they were preaching. And the Roman Catholic Church was behind this. It should be stressed that this awful speech was reprinted in Zagreb's official journal. Okay? Immediately after that same journal published the message of Monsignor Archbishop Aloysius Stepanik of Zagreb, who defines Serbs. This is a Catholic archbishop. I think he was appointed, he was canonized a saint, yes, by Pope John Paul II. Ain't that the pot calling the kettle black? Uh, on July 31st of the year, the same periodical, well, what he called, oh, I found out. Yeah, he called them. He called the Serbs renegades from the Catholic Church and welcomed the new law. Now, you see how these people operate? This is 1941. Now, we got a bunch of Jesuits in America saying everybody can practice any religion they want. You don't hear anybody say, oh, the Lutherans are renegades from the Catholic Church. No. But in Serbia, in, in Croatia, they're calling them renegades. And well, and not only calling them that, killing them. On July 31st of that very year, the same periodical called for an acceleration of the process of conversion of Serbs to Catholicism. In 1943, Stepanik wrote to the Vatican that over 240,000 Serbs had been converted to Catholicism in the independent state of Croatia. Now, how are they converted? Well, they put a gun to their head and said, if you don't convert, we're going to kill you. This is the atmosphere in which conversion, or to be more exact, the forced conversion of Serbs to Catholicism was being carried out. The call of priest, uh, boy, these names, uh, I can't pronounce it, we'll call him DJ, addressed to the residents of the village of Stasa, where he came to forcibly baptize Orthodox into Catholicism, was as follows. Here's what he said. We are well aware where those who reject the baptism will be sent. I have already cleansed all these southern lands from infants to elders, and I'm ready to do the same here if necessary, because today there would be no sin in killing a seven-year-old child if he is impeding the progress of our Eustasi regime. This is a Catholic priest saying, if you don't, if you reject the baptism, you will be sent to a concentration camp, camp and killed, no matter if you're a seven-year-old boy. Disregard my priestly vestments. Know that if need be, I can take a submachine gun and annihilate all who will resist the state and the Eustasi authorities. Can you believe? Yeah. How in the world can you take anybody seriously in this country that still backs this organization and will not allow the truth to come out? You can't because nobody knows. And the people that are running this country from the, from the media and from our government know they have to keep this quiet or they ain't going to have any power. But rebaptism didn't guarantee life. The Eustasi would often lock the newly baptized Serbs in Orthodox churches and burn them alive and use some other methods of execution, explaining to the converts, we need your souls and not your bodies. Notably, only peasants were rebaptized, while Serbs living in towns were doomed to annihilation as they were regarded as bearers of the Serbian national consciousness and unfit for re-education. All right, you get that? So they baptize you, then they burn you, and they say, we need your souls. Now, you're going to go way back. And I remember talking to uh, 
someone who told me once, he researched the Vatican Jesuit goal and said they not only want to control you on earth, but they want to control and take you to the depths of hell and control the afterlife, whatever that may be. So they're not just satisfied with you here. They want to take you to the depths of hell wherever they're going. Monsignor Archbishop Stepanek approved all this. He was behind what that priest said. And he's been canonized a saint. More than that, here we go, Pope Pius XII thanked Stepanek and the Catholic priests for their efforts to convert and do it in this manner and informed the Pope that 240,000 Serbs had been converted. So, see the connection between Hitler's Pope and what was going on here? And how he said, hey, that's fantastic. If you can't baptize this seven-year-old, just kill him. And you know what they did to many of these people? Like I said, they baptized them, then they burned them in the church. And, you know, people today, to this day, will say to me, well, they've changed. They've changed. And I say, no, they haven't. They may change their methods a little, but their goals are still the same. This didn't happen a long time ago. Now, Catholic priests, monks, and nuns took the most active part in this genocide of Orthodox Serbs. The second commandment of the notorious Josenovic camp, guess who was? The second commandant of the notorious Jasanovic Kavat was a Franciscan priest named Miroslav Filipovic. And this is a quote from somebody that was there. Every night he left his house to slaughter and returned to dawn with his vestments stained with blood. Once a prisoner was led up to him with Phil Ivanovic was dining, the priest stood up and coolly murdered him. After that he sat down and finished his dinner saying, call a grave digger. It was said that he would enjoy drinking his victim's blood and repeat, this is the communist and Jewish blood. Let me drink my fill. And he was not only the, not the only clergyman butcher of Jasanovic. There were also the infamous Jasanovic guards, monks, and they got their names here, who would kill the camp prisoners. So we're not talking about just inciting this. We're talking about actually taking part in this. Now, fast forward to the lawsuit we talked about here on this show many times, the Alperin v. Vatican Bank, where an attorney from the United States brought a case to bring financial reparations to the family members of the victims of Jasanovic of this genocide. And you know what? None of this got to the light of day, and the great Ninth Circuit Court here in San Francisco decided that the Vatican doesn't do business in America, so you can't bring the lawsuit. What a bunch of horseshit. And you know that what I'm telling you is true, that they are in bed with the same group of killers that did this atro these atrocities in Serbia, and they have not changed. The only thing that's changed is this country gives them more cover so they can do this again and again and again. Franciscan monks carried out mass executions in the villages, in the villages of Draculic and Sargovac, where 2,000 Serbs were slaughtered. An Ustasi detachment that carried out ethnic cleansing of Serbs was commanded by a monk, Monk Augustine, who would always carry arms in his hands. Monk Schultz forcibly converted Serbs to Catholicism and was not afraid to massacre Serbian priests and laity who refused to become Catholics. A Catholic priest from Udbina, Mr. Mogis, in his sermon called on the faithful to expel Serbs in Croatia and exterminate them. And these were thousands of such examples. According to to the International Commission for Truth on Jasenovic. 1,400 Catholic priests, two-thirds of the total number, were involved in this genocide, actually killing people. 
The barbarous cruelty of Catholic priests went beyond all bounds, so that even Germans, who would not <laughs> not care about shooting a hundred Serbian captives for one German soldier, had to intervene, because they couldn't take what these priests were doing. Thus, priest Manta Granovic was executed together with several other Ustashi by the Nazis for these mass atrocities against Serbs. And they were involved, these Catholic priests, were involved with this genocide right up to the end of the war. Where the hell was America? This is 1941 to 1944. You know that we didn't get involved in the war until all these Jews were killed. We knew about World War II and could have been there a lot earlier. There was a reason. And that reason's really never been explored in our history books, has it? Realizing that it is impossible to save the reputation of the clergy, the Croatian clergy. How do you how do you do how do you save anybody that's done this when you got eyewitness documentation that this is going on? What do you do if you're the Vatican? Well, the apologists of the Catholic Church are trying to whitewash Archbishop Stepanek, claiming that he either didn't know about the horrific crimes of his clergy or actively struggled against them. So they turn it around, like they do here. For example, Joe Biden, who's a good Catholic and Jesuit follower, he goes to, he goes to the Ukraine and bribes the uh, Ukrainian government and states, if you don't fire the prosecutor who's, re who's, you know, his son was on some really criminal company out of the Ukraine. He had no, he had no experience in oil and gas, and he was making 80000 a month, but this Ukrainian prosecutor was going to investigate this company. Biden says, when he was vice president, if you don't, fire that prosecutor, I'm not giving you, a, what, a billion dollars in aid. So they fired him, <laughs> they fired him uh, in six hours, and Biden laughed about it. He's, he's on tape saying this, but the Democrats are doing nothing about it. But they're, they're claiming that Trump on a phone call should be impeached because he wanted to investigate a little bit and have the government investigate some of this stuff, which is completely... Okay. Well, wouldn't you want that to happen? Yeah. But guess what? They always accuse you of doing what they do. And they learn this from the Jesuits. So they claim that he didn't know, he didn't do it, these other people did it, and neither version holds water, any water. But that's the lie you're going to hear in the history books. And none of this holds water. Stepanek was a well-informed man and too power-hungry not to have control of his own diocese. As to the allegation that Stepanek was a well uh, Stepanek struggled against the clergy who were subordinate to him, we don't find any signs of that anywhere. As the leader, and that's coming from people who researched this, as the leader of the military clergy in Croatia, Stepanek did nothing to prevent those under his authority from committing these heinous crimes. More than that, he awarded murderers with icons and crosses instead of excommunicating them. You know, to this day, Hitler has not been excommunicated. More than that, he awarded these uh, <laughs> icons and crosses. He supported the Ustasi leader Anta, Ante Pavlik and his program, accepted his awards, backed up the new authorities in every way, and publicly encouraged all of this that was going on. Therefore, at least, as a propagandist administrator who covered up the crimes, he was involved in the genocide. Stepanek played a major role in the neutralization of any possible opposition to the genocide in the Vatican. In 1941, he actively advocated the diplomatic recognition of the independent state of Croatia by the Vatican, which the latter finally did de facto. What's more, Pope Pius XII would meet delegations of the Croatian Eustace in Rome. Although Rome did, did receive reports of their atrocities, they knew what was going on and backed it all the way. So, there you have it. 
is the little background of one genocide they were involved in. And I will assure you that the other ones that I've researched, along with uh, many others, you find the same atrocities, the same stuff going on. And my friends, do you think that they have changed? And ask yourself one question. Do you think they change? And ask yourself, why does the American government and the media cover up for this? And then give me your answers. Yeah, and listen to my show on the investigative journal, gregantonysjournal.wordpress.com. And once you understand that this is one of the biggest stories that needs to be told so that we can understand why the world is the way it is and why our government continues to cover up for them. I don't think there's anything more important and why they've taken over <laughs> basically Protestantism in this country, doing it by infiltration. Back tomorrow on The Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today. So you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The prophecy. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it. It has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.